Hi, my name is EJ Massa, and I'm an addict, a CRT addict. The first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem, and here's my story. Every day I go on eBay and Facebook Marketplace and look for CRT televisions for me to make detailed mod videos about. I thought I was doing well and staying away from the phosphor glow that emanates from those glorious glass tubes. But I saw this 32-inch Sony Trinitron floor model TV for free on Facebook Marketplace, and I fell off the wagon. It looked so beautiful. See, I thought to myself, sure, I've been playing retro video games, but have I truly played them? If they aren't encased in fake wood grain, the answer is no. Anyways, I got it mostly because I wanted to make content out of it. I looked it up on the internet, and this TV is an AA1 chassis Sony Trinitron, which is, in fact, RGB moddable. That basically means we'll mod this TV to accept a higher quality signal than Compositor S video. Consumer TVs in the US typically only had RF inputs, or composite, or sometimes S video, while RGB inputs were more common in Europe in the form of SCART connectors. The jungle chip inside this 32-inch Sony Trinitron is capable of accepting RGB signals. It's just being used by the closed captioning system, which we are going to hijack for this video. So the TV itself is in great condition, although it is quite dirty. Pet hair covers the speakers that are built into this stand. But other than the layer of dust and pet hair, it looks great. No obvious damage. The stock inputs are RF, S-Video, and Composite, and it even has audio out. And as you can see, the model number is KV32TW67, and it was built in July of 1995. First things first, I used a Swiffer to get some of the bigger dust bunnies, and I also used a lint brush to get some of the peskier pet hair. This door was taped to move it into my house so it wouldn't shatter, so I removed that. I used some glass cleaner to wipe off this grimy screen, and underneath the grime, the screen looks like it's in fantastic condition. I think the former owner must have just used this TV as a surface to hold old magazines, and it's collected dust for decades. With the superficial surfaces cleaned, let's see how the S-Video looks on this thing. When I think of big Sony Trinitron TVs from the 90s, I personally think the N64. In fact, we had a similar Sony Trinitron on Christmas morning in 1996. Now, I usually played games in the basement on an older Magnavox TV, but at least on Christmas, my parents let me play on the big TV, and it was glorious. So seeing the N64 on a similar screen almost brought a tear to my eye. I'd say the N64 was made for screens like this. And my unmodded N64 from childhood can only output composite and S-Video, so this is kind of the perfect television for it. But Super Nintendo also looks very good through S-Video. It's not PVM sharp, but it looks very organic and natural. Some of the colors, specifically red, smear around a bit, but honestly, I could play with S-Video only and be completely happy with my gaming experience on this TV. In fact, I did a video specifically saying that sometimes S-Video is good enough. But I have brain problems, and I'm never happy, so let me risk making this 260-pound television into a piece of trash by modding it in the hopes to have a slightly better picture. Who cares if it brought a tear to my eye? <laughs> There's content to make. As a quick aside, this is the remote that came with the TV, and it's pretty interesting. It has this switch on the side that changes the buttons. However, the button markings are rubbed off, and it only works if you really press down on those things. It's also cracked on the front, so I opted to get this Universal Commander remote off eBay, and this works great. Alright, enough of my rambling. Let's go to the mod. And the guide I mainly followed was this AA1 chassis mod guide on Sunthar's Super Sector. This website has a ton of other RGB mods, so check it out if you want to see if your CRT can be modded. Since this model falls into the AA1 chassis family, this guide should work. And I looked at the schematics in the service manual, and indeed, the mod should work in the same way by hijacking the closed captioning system. First things first, I loosened the screws on the back of the television. There were three on the outer sides, 
three near the inputs, and finally, I loosened the one on the top, and carefully removed the back panel. And yeah, the inside was just as dirty as the outside. Lots of dust bunnies, especially on the sides, on the bottom. It's kind of cute how small the boards look inside this giant thing. Lots of room for activities in here. To get the large dust bunnies, I used the Swiffer Duster. I then attacked the boards with some compressed air to get the light layer of dust off of those. The interesting thing about this TV is that there's a cage of boards here. And the ones we need aren't on the board on the flyback, so we don't even need to screw around with the anode cap. We just need to get to these separate boards, which can be removed. I removed this board on top first. I went around and started disconnecting all the cables on the vertical boards. I gotta say, it really helps to take pictures of your disassembly, or even doing what I'm doing now and filming yourself disassembling, because then you can just go back and watch the footage if you're ever unsure of how it comes together. Take lots of pictures and videos as you're going along. After I disconnected the wires from these vertical boards, I removed the back board with the inputs as well as the two boards to the left and right of the M board, which is my first target. I was going to remove that one too, but I looked at it and it was in the perfect position to remove three capacitors that connect to the RGB inputs on the jungle chip. The capacitors I'm targeting are C315, C316, and C317. This is obviously the connections underneath the board and the capacitors are on the other side. I like that currently the M board is in a vertical position plugged into the bottom board so I can easily just bring my desoldering gun in and starting with C315 I desoldered one lead and then I desoldered the other lead. Wiggling the capacitor with my finger on the other side so that the leads of the capacitor free themselves from the through hole, and then I can finally wiggle the capacitor out. And then I repeat the process with the other capacitors. Touch the desoldering gun to the leads until the solder liquefies, activate the vacuum, and then do the other lead. Until finally, all the capacitors are removed. And then I can satisfyingly show you these newly orphaned components. I love creating orphans. Orphan components. The next component is a little tougher to get to, so I removed the M board from the assembly and brought it to my soldering station. My target is R165, which is roughly in the middle of the board. I grabbed it with some tweezers while heating up the solder on both sides until the tiny resistor popped off. Now my boards are ready for me to solder a SCART connector to it. Speaking of SCART connectors, here are the pieces I'll use for my mod. This is the Sunthar's RGB MUX board, which you can find a link on the guide. Occasionally he'll sell these parts as a kit, although I had to buy these parts individually because the kit was out of stock. I ordered the MUX board, built to order, on Oshpark. I opted for the 1.2B version because I had the 90 degree angle SCART connector, which I got from console5.com. If you have a straight connector, you need the 1.C version. Now obviously you don't have to use this board, you can follow a guide and just solder the parts right to the SCART connector, like this wiring guide on CRT database. But I thought this looked super clean. Basically you take this 10 pin male IDC connector and solder it on this side of the board. Then on the other side I'll solder the SCART connector. That way the SCART connector can detach with the back panel if I ever need to do future maintenance on the CRT. Here's where we will solder all the components needed. And you can reference the numbers on the guide and just solder them into place. I ordered many of my components and SCART connectors from console5.com and the rest from Amazon and DigiKey. All the components are in their proper place and the leads are bent to keep them in place while I solder them to the board. And that's what I did. One by one, soldered both sides of the components. And then snipped off the excess leads. With those guys snugly in place and cleaned up, I placed the 10 pin connector on the side opposite to the components. You have to make sure this little window on the connector faces out like this. And then, again, going one by one, soldering the legs of that connector to the board. Now that it's solidly in place, I put the SCART connector on the same side as the components. Now you don't need to solder every through hole here. I could be wrong, but I don't think there's a harm in doing that, but I only solder the necessary leads illustrated by this diagram. The obvious ones are labeled, and then there's a few grounds that need to be soldered. And there we go, our completed SCART connector, which will be embedded into the back panel of the television. Now to create the connection that will go into that. This is the female side of the 10-pin IDC connector, 
and I'll thread this rainbow ribbon cable through it. You need to make sure the black wire is on the left side where this raised groove is. Then I used a crimp tool to squeeze the connection into the wires. I cut off any excess wire on the other side and now we have this handy, easy to disconnect from the back panel ribbon cable. Just to illustrate, the SCART connector will be in the back panel and this ribbon cable will go to all the solder points on all the boards and we connect it like so. So let's go back to the end board and solder all the wires we'll need to go to this ribbon cable assembly. Starting with this brown blanking wire which will solder to where the R165 resistor was. It's this pad here, make doubly sure you solder to the correct side. I added fresh solder to the pad and the wire and then put it into place. I also slipped some heat shrink tube there to make sure any exposed wire is covered to prevent any accidental shorts. Then I soldered a red wire to the positive through hole of C317, a blue wire to the positive through hole of C315, and finally a green wire to C316, and yeah, there's our RGB signal right there. And that's everything on the M board. Red, green, blue, and blanking. Over on the UA board, which is the back board closest to the inputs, I soldered a gray audio right channel to this location here, a white left audio channel to this spot above the R403 resistor, a black ground wire to this ground pad near R407, and a yellow sync wire to this pad near R407. This hijacks the Luma input on the S video connector for sync. Finally, another ground wire with the purple wire is at this ground point here. All the wires I put shrink tubing to hopefully prevent external shorts near the base of them, and I threaded the wires toward the bottom of the board so that it will go toward the left of the inputs on the back. Here's the M board back in place on the UA board, and you can see the RGB wires and the blanking wires threaded through the hole on the bottom there, and then it joins the audio sync and ground from the UA board and then the ribbon cable goes to the SCAR connector. And I actually shortened the ribbon cable after I shot this because it was too long and I didn't want to cause interference. And also just a note, the orange cable is unused, but it could be used as an optional ground. I reassembled everything, put the whole cage of boards back together, and before I go any farther with a reassembly, I'll give the system a test. I connected my SNES via SCART to my new connector, and by some miracle, the thing freaking works the first try. It looks a tad dim, so I went to the menu, and yes, the menu works in this mod, and cranked the picture setting all the way up. And that looks perfect. I tried out some Mega Man X, and holy cow, this looks awesome. The fuzziness and the color red smearing is gone. It looks sharp, but doesn't look too sharp, like some of the late stage CRTs. It just looks very natural and easy on the eyes, and the colors are more balanced, deeper, and richer. All right, now to put the SCART connector into place. Just using a SCART template I got from console5.com, I used a pencil to trace the outline of the connector to give myself a guide on where to cut. And then I marked where the screws will go based on the template. Now with plastic TV backs, you may have to use a Dremel tool or something to make your SCART connecting hole. Scart connecting hole, it sounds dirty. But this particle board was so soft, I basically just slid my pocket knife through the back and carved a hole following my pencil guide. And just to test, my connector slides right in there. I drilled some holes for my number eight, three quarters of an inch long screws. And there we go, the connector is in place. On the other side, you'll see washers and nuts locking it into place. And then I screw the back panel back on. Easy peasy. Here's my fully functioning SCART input. And in order to make it work properly though, you need to plug a dummy S-Video connector for sync and an RCA plug into the right audio channel to enable stereo sound. I'll have a link to where I got these in the description below. Since we disconnected the closed captioning system, I'd like to remove it from the menu. And to do that, we'll access the service menu. With the television turned off, I press display five, up volume, and then power. And that goes straight into the service menu. Using the one and four buttons, I navigated to the ID2 menu item and changed the value of that item using the three and six buttons and changed the value from 72 to eight. And to save that, I pressed muting and then enter to write that into memory. Now, if you restart the TV, go to the regular menu, see? 
the closed caption system is gone. I also used the service menu to do some minor geometry fixes. I didn't go too crazy with calibration because I thought it looked good already to me and that's what's important. And it does look good. I especially like how crisp it looks in the Super Mario World title. And again, it's sharp, but not too sharp. And the colors aren't as thin as they were with S video. You know, I have a PVM and sometimes it looks too perfect. And this is just right, a vibrant, organic picture. Here's a side by side with S video. S video on the left and RGB on the right. The best I can describe it is if you have a compressed JPEG versus a raw file from a digital camera. But also if you look, Mario's reds are a little more smeared as if the reds are wet ink and you accidentally smudge them with the sides of your palm. While in the RGB image, everything is in its proper place and balanced correctly. So was it all worth the effort? I'd say so. The image is just what I was looking for and it's on a TV that reminds me of one that I had in my family's living room in the mid to late 90s. And one of the best parts is, now that it has a SCART input, I can connect my RGB Pi to play a huge library of 240p retro gaming or watch anime waifus now made better on a 32 inch screen surrounded by fake wood grain. I've already used this setup extensively on my gaming stream, so you should really check me out on Twitch. My handle is EJ Massa, or you can watch the archive of my streams on YouTube at EJ Streams. I usually stream on Sundays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I suspect that composite or S video on a CRT is more than good enough to scratch that retro gaming itch, but if you're feeling a little adventurous and maybe a little crazy, I hope this educated you enough on the modding experience. Special shout out to Sunthar's Guide for being the basis of this video. Let me know if you want to see more console or TV mods in the future. And that's all I have for now. Until next time, bye.